new technology is seen as the key to sustainable energy and two energy carriers at the forefront of new thinking are hydrogen and electricity. Through electrolysis of water, one can produce the other, but at what cost? From powering rockets to heating our homes, hydrogen has been seen as a key innovative energy carrier. One Swiss hydro plant is using water to power electrolysis to store its excess energy as hydrogen. As you can see in the background, you see the, the hydro plant and it starts with the energy of this hydro plant and at the end of that of the process you see also water as the only byproduct. Most hydrogen is still produced from fossil fuels, which does involve a lot of water. But it can, as we saw when we visited Aberdeen, keep pollution down in built-up areas. We had a really, really positive response from the public. I think they really like to feel that they're part of this, uh, you know, this change that is going right across the world. But also, they really like the buses because we have no harmful emissions. It's only water vapour, water that comes out of the tailpipe. In San Diego, we met a team of scientists who are trying to mimic photosynthesis by using special semiconductors with the potential to both clean polluted water and make hydrogen. 50% of our world's population are still lived in decentralized community and developing countries, and they do not have enough access of the water and energy infrastructures. So what I'm doing here, I hope, is I can help this large number of population to solve their water and energy issues in the future. Electricity is the power we mostly take for granted, but around 80% of its production relies on fossil fuel and thermal power, i.e. the heating and cooling of large amounts of water to generate electricity. Later in the year, we went to Germany to visit a coal mine that could be turned into a pumped storage facility, converting dirty energy store into clean energy store. In times of energy need, you are just uh, turbine the water uh, towards the deep reservoir, the lower reservoir, and in uh, case you are, have an over excess of energy in the grid, you're taking this energy from the grid in order to recharge the battery to refill the upper reservoir. And we saw how efficiency can mean that battery-powered planes are no longer the stuff of dreams, with this one capable of carrying two passengers 400 kilometers. One goal of the aircraft was to reduce energy consumption, um, so we need about 10 times less energy to fly the aircraft compared to a conventional aircraft. And developments in microgrids mean ones like this one in India can allow wind, solar and biomass to take more of the load and reduce our reliance on conventional power stations. Bruce, hydrogen seems like it has great potential as a water-friendly fuel carrier, but we're not quite there yet, are we? No, we're not. Um, right now, most hydrogen is made from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is taking primarily natural gas, making that hydrogen, and then using that hydrogen. So we have benefits from using the hydrogen, mm -hmm. but it still relies upon fossil fuels. So why is hydrogen seen as such a great potential or has such great potential as a sustainable energy source? Well, if we start with water and we electrolyze water and we use some renewable energy source to do that, mm -hmm. then we can use the hydrogen and we end up with water when we're done. Mm -hmm. So it's a water to water cycle and we don't need to burn all that air like we do when we burn a fossil fuel. Tell me some of the biggest uses of hydrogen today. Well one of the biggest uses is actually to make fertilizer, to make ammonia. Mm -hmm. um, but the second biggest use is actually to make gasoline from oil. What people don't realize is that a lot of hydrogen is used when we make gasoline. Mm -hmm. And if we were to take that hydrogen that we use to make gasoline and just ran vehicles on fuel cells, mm -hmm. we could run a lot of cars, maybe half the cars in the US, light duty cars, you know, could run off of this hydrogen. Bruce, finally tell me, could the combination of hydrogen and electricity be the holy grail for electricity output or is this just a pipe dream? It's not a pipe dream. I mean, this is really uh, doable in our lifetimes. Um, 20 years ago, solar power, uh, solar electricity was very expensive. Mm -hmm and today that price has dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're very close to being able to electrolyze water mm -hmm. and make hydrogen using solar power. And we can store that hydrogen mm -hmm. for when we need to use it. If we can accomplish that, if we can accomplish making hydrogen from solar and wind energy, mm -hmm. 
we are really close to the hydrogen economy. We often talk about the 2050 sustainable energy goals. Do you think it could be done in time for them? With a concerted effort, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. It has been a pleasure to talking with you as well. Thank you. As we saw earlier, most electricity provision still relies on polluting and water-hungry fossil fuels. But there are two energy sources that are often cited as having a low carbon footprint, hydropower and nuclear. So let's take a look at the size of their water footprint. Now the fastest growing source of energy after renewables is nuclear. In 2014, nuclear power accounted for 11% of the world's electricity generation. They may be controversial, but new nuclear power stations like this 1600 megawatt one in Finland are still being built. Well, we produce quite a lot of ele electricity, about 20% almost. And then when all kilo to three, the power plant here is uh, running, so it will be 30% of the Finnish electricity. But while nuclear may be seen to have a low carbon footprint, it does however have a large water footprint, as the process mainly works on thermal generation. There are new technologies out there, such as this small modular reactor, which potentially could use less water and provide more flexibility. And with the help of Professor Robin Rogers, we may not run out of uranium itself. He wants to mine it from seawater. There's more uranium in the ocean than on any known land deposits or even guessed land deposits. Now, of course, the ocean is really big, so it's dilute. But there's no question that the amount of uranium in the ocean could satisfy mankind's needs for nuclear power for many, many generations to come. Nuclear fission produces huge energy, but many scientists see the future as using fusion, a process that combines nuclei rather than splitting them apart. The problem at present is that it takes more energy to cause fusion than they can take out of the process. In our very first episode of the year, we saw the awesome power of hydro at the Itaipu Dam bordering Brazil and Paraguay. Our generating units are 700 megawatts each. We have 20 generating units uh, installed, which comprise a total of 14,000 megawatts. Water that flows through dams like this is the backbone of renewable sources for electricity generation globally supplying 71% of all renewable electricity. And it's not just the monster dams. Microhydro can really change lives and cause less environmental damage, such as this project in Nepal, where the electricity provided has really helped to grow the local economy. And as we learned at turbine maker Jilks, while there is a water footprint in hydro construction, it is a simple and reliable technology that can last a long time. These machines worldwide, wherever they are, have been in for a very long time, over a hundred years in some instances. Recently we've carried out some upgrading work really, uh, of some equipment on a tea estate in Kenya, where they have five machines of ours dating back to the 1920s. The construction phase of larger dams definitely has a sizeable water impact, but once running, this reduces, as they're not using thermal generation. Professor Keller, can you tell us a bit more about the concept of water reuse, maybe specifically thinking of environmental considerations? So the water sector is, has changed very many of the perspectives and the way it thinks about water. And when we look at the water cycle, we have many flows. We have grey water, we have black water, we have surface water, groundwater. And we're now starting to view all of these waters as good water, but they're just waters of different grades. And sometimes with some treatment, that water can be reused, but in some cases without any further treatment, that water can be reused. So the overall water footprint is going to be much smaller than it was in the past. Given everything that we've talked about, looking short, medium and long term, where do you see the major stress points occurring? So future water scarcity is going to mean that we're going to have to move water further distances, move water from afar to meet where it's needed. That's going to require more energy because water is heavy. If you couple that with our interest in low carbon energy, many of those uh, technologies are going to require quite a lot of water, so this water energy nexus comes into play. 
if you sort of wrap all of this into the economic transformation that's taking place in developing countries, most of that economic transformation is going to require lots of water and lots of energy. But I'm very hopeful. I think that you know we can navigate these challenges because there are great innovations taking place in technology. And key to this is, is good governance. We need to have the institutions that manage these different sectors, so for example, water and energy, these institutions need to be working together. We need to create collaborative platforms that you know, understand the water energy nexus. It's only by bringing these actors together, getting them around the table, working together, that's when the magic will take place. And I'm very confident that the magic will happen and we will manage the situation well. Great. Well, Professor Kanna, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So it's absolutely clear that water just has to be a part of our energy thinking. Our goal this series has been to look at some of the work and innovation shaping positive change in the energy field. This is the last in a present series of Sustainable Energy, but we will be back next year. And in the meantime, you can still get in touch with us on Twitter at CNBC Energy using the hashtags AskSE and Sustainable Energy. We hope you can join us next year as we continue the quest for sustainable energy. Until then, keep thinking green. Goodbye. Goodbye. Still watching? Perfect. Click here to watch another great video from CNBC International. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.